welcome Juan Castillo Rowe from uh, University of Canberra. I'm really excited to have you here. We've had lots of emails over the years and I've been following your work and uh, I'm excited to learn a little bit more about yourself and also your research. So to start, um, where did you first develop your passion for water? Well, Tom, thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm delighted to be, delighted to be here. And to be honest, it, um, I think the passion for groundwater happened by, by chance. When I was studying my undergraduate degree, most of my, my friends uh, were choosing the same pathways in civil engineering, uh, mechanical, electrical. So I, uh, I kind of just looked for whatever people weren't doing, <laughs> which was water. So out of 500 people, we were only graduating at that university, one or two hyd hydrogeologists. So I guess it, it, it says a little bit about my interest of doing um, things differently. Contrarian from the start, I like it. Yeah. Uh, and I guess that leads to my next question as well. How does your personality, uh, or if you want to expand on that, or your personal interests make you a yeah. better scientist? Yeah, well, uh, I lo love that question. Um, I'm a very passionate surfer, and I've traveled around the world um, looking for waves. And that has had a substantial impact in my, um, my career as a scientist, because I've I've, I saw the world early on in my life and different kinds of livelihoods and different cultures. And that really um, sort of shaped me as a scientist um, and kind of being trained as a water engineer, civil engineer, this, this other aspect of my life um, made me focus on the human um, elements. And I think that that's where most of my... <laughs> my passion for uh, like blending groundwater and social science comes from. Mm -hmm. So staying on the ground, true to people's beliefs and their needs and concerns. Mm -hmm. Or staying on the water, it sounds like. And also, yeah. Yeah, I have a <laughs> funny anecdote doing my master thesis in Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. Uh, I was searching for submarine groundwater discharge in a kayak. And yeah, in between the tides, I was uh, catching lots of waves. Uh, nice. It's a nice. good, it's a good mix. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sounds good. Um, and a lot of your work is at that interface between between humans and and water, or, and and often how can we be more sustainable about our water use and consumption, and and so how how do you try to make your work impact well beyond uh, the ac academic world, beyond the ivory tower? Yeah, well. Uh... The message of my talk today is that sustainability to me, it's a human problem. It starts and it ends with people. And I really, uh, I try to stick to that uh, by all means. And I'm, I'm not comfortable enough with, um, like through my research, just communicated numbers. I think it's a lot more than that. It's about beliefs, values, um, a culture, uh, and so I've, I've been like, that's what I strive for is to communicate groundwater science using this, uh, uh language that goes beyond the numbers. And that's what I'm, I'm going to talk about, um, in a second. Yeah. Wonderful. And before we get into your talk, just one more question, uh, of all the myriad of papers you've read over your life as, as an academic, what is the one, if you want to share it with you know, mm. the next generation of, of students and young professionals who will be watching these videos, what is one that you think has yeah. most impacted you and you would like to share? Yeah, well, mo more than a paper, it's a book. Uh, mm. And this is kind of a life hack. I try to search for knowledge in books because it's a more curated, uh, higher level form of knowledge. And I would- A book? What is that? What is that? I, a, a book. A like book. I mean, it's you not mean a, like a thing with actual paper and- like, Yeah, 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 a book. So it's okay. not a paper, it's a book that really- <laughs> It's the um, Growing Artificial Societies book mm. by Epstein and Axtell. And that was a eye opener for me. I could, I, they presented this way of seeing the world using simulation and they just grow this beautiful artificial society of agents that are, are actually they're, they're facing a very real common pool resource problem. And, and it looks very much like what, the problems we're facing with groundwater, they grow it in the computer and they actually explore ways to solve those problems in a computer, which to me was mind blowing. I 
can see how that impacted a lot of your work. All right, I look forward to uh, hearing more in your talk. Okay, thanks, Tom, for inviting me for this talk. Uh, the title of my talk today is Groundwater Sustainability. It's all about the people, people. So those that are uh, fond of pop music would know about uh, the song. I stole this from a song. And uh, so I was looking at Vina's video last night, and I thought it would be nice to create some sort of thread between the Water Underground talk videos. So my starting point is the question she poses at the end that really resonates with me and is the question of how do we make the invisible visible in groundwater, which speaks to this idea of these, this common pool resource that we tend to uh, overuse quite often and that we can't really see or we, for some reason we can't really manage it properly. So I'd just like to add a trailing question and also how do we make uh, this wicked problem manageable? And I know Tom is a very positive person, so my positive message for today is that, um, and if there's one thing you have to remember from this talk, is that to me, sustainability is a human problem, and it starts and it ends with people, so we're causing the problem, but we're also part of the solution. So groundwater is probably as a wicked problem as it gets. It's, uh, we can imagine it as a basketball that we need to balance. And usually we think about things like uh, balancing on one side, the economy, growth, the money, on the other side, the environment. But it's also all these things in the middle that are so hard to define, like values and what is prosperity and resilience and those things that we, we can't really um, model with a groundwater model. Um, we have some tools to manage these things, some regulation or governance or management or arrangements, and everything is hinging on a changing climate. This is, these are some examples of how this is playing out in Australia, in the Murray-Darling Basin. But it, it's a common problem around the world. Uh, there's multiple actors and perspectives at play, things happening at multiple scales. There's no single solution. But I think what Vina was referring to is that once you poke these systems, you try to do something, pretty much anything can, can happen. So there's unintended consequences. So I want you to think uh, for one second about a problem, groundwater problem you've encountered during your career uh, or your training as a groundwater scientist and think about how we could avoid dropping this ball. Uh, a good example of this is a project I'm working on at the moment, the Salar de Atacama in Chile. Uh, there's all this talk about building electric cars and decarbonizing the economy. And this, this is a really wicked and in interesting problem because the biggest reserve of lithium in the world is, in the, uh, is found in these brines in the Atacama Desert. So fulfilling this dream of decarbonizing uh, our world hinges on strangling places like this. And there's Aboriginal values attached to these uh, brines, uh, there's uh, traditional agriculture, there's the interest of developing the country. Um, and and it, all this is driven by a global uh, desire to make the world better. So how do we deal with that? Uh, to me, and this is my, uh, what I've, I've arrived at many years of work, and to me, the solution and the way to make things visible is by tapping into the so-called wisdom of the crowd. And there's a book if you wanna if you wanna read it. And that book starts with a very interesting story about a submarine that gets lost in the middle of the Atlantic, and a captain that needs to solve this problem. Like, where? How do we find the submarine? Um, there was very little evidence where where the submarine was. Nobody really knew what happened, and uh, none of the experts could really answer the question. But so this this kind of sounds like the kind of what groundwater problems we're dealing with. So the result, I'll just give it away. Uh, so this very smart person came up with a, a way of tapping into the wisdom of the crowd, and the result was that they found a submarine 70 meters from the estimate that uh, that uh, a group of people made. That process had four ingredients uh, that are shown there on the screen. There was some sort of diversity, 
local knowledge was considered, the opinions of experts were independent, and there was some process of aggregating uh, that knowledge. So I just want you to think for a second, in the way we solve groundwater problems today, do, do we really have these four ingredients? I think we don't, and we're just tapping into the wisdom of the few. And this, I, 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 I think what I'm going to show now is uh, sort of summarizes the way we're tackling these, these problems. Um, so usually there's a groundwater issue that's raised by a stakeholder or a group of stakeholders. It's taken some, to some sort of decision maker. Then they contact us, groundwater experts or so-called groundwater experts. And we build a model, the groundwater model, and we present that in a report or presentation, numbers and statistics that very people can understand. And that's, uh, that's used to make an investment or a management decision. So of course, um, many would agree that those, uh, that pro those processes are not tapping into the wisdom of the crowd. So th this is my uh, formula. and. It's not that I, I wouldn't, I'm not claiming it's a definite formula, but I, I found it works and in terms of making this invisible visible and the wicked manageable. So I think you need to start by putting the issue on the table, literally, and bring people together in one way or another. You need to get into their heads, and I'll speak about this in a second. Uh, it's very important that we start at the level of mental models. I said at the beginning, Sustainability is a problem, it's a human problem. So we need, really need to get deep into people's heads. We need ways to conceptualize the, these mental models that people have. We need a way to aggregate that. Then it would be nice if we could take that knowledge and, and start playing with it in, in a more or less controlled environment. And we can do that with uh, simulation models, so-called agent-based models. And this is the interesting part. Only then, I think, we're in a position to integrate by physically based groundwater models and make them speak and plug them in uh, to these simulation models. And finally, in the delivery side of things, I think there's two things we need to do. One is we need to go back to the stakeholders in a way that is meaningful and genuine and understandable to them. And we can do that by learning by experience. And I'll speak briefly about management flight simulators as a way to do that. And the other thing, which I won't go into much detail because it's, it's, it's kind of a co complex problem, is uh, we need to communicate the role of variability and uncertainty, and uncertainty. So these are the ingredients for my uh, uh, recipe to make the invisible visible and the wicked manageable. So you need to treat everybody as an expert. Everybody has a piece of the puzzle. So you need, so not only scientific knowledge is important, also tacit. So the, the, the things that people like what farmers know when they just are growing their crops and they see the rain come and there's things there that, uh, that are really valuable and we need to tap, tap on. So this idea of co-constructing models of how groundwater flows and how it interacts with society is critical. And also because we need to build models that people want and they need. Uh, we need to tap into something called the IKEA effect. So this is a psychological trick that businesses use on us and I'm inviting everybody to use it for the benefit of um, groundwater sustainability. And it's it, nothing more, not, nothing less than making people build models with us uh, because if they do they will own those models and whatever knowledge or insights we gain from them if we do this we're going to stretch this uh kind of typical bias process where issues and like all the technical aspects are dealt with by the experts and the decisions are just communicated at the very end of the process we can really stretch those areas uh, those efforts and, and, and we just become facilitators of the process. There's lots of tools to do this. Uh, you can, uh, for those that are interested, you can look at, um, they're classified under the umbrella of participatory modeling. So 
there's a little summary of the, these tools. So I just wanted to prompt you to think about that problem you considered at the beginning of the talk and think about what tools you would be deploying or you would be combining to address that problem. So have a look at, look at that diagram and think about how would you, what, which ones would you pick? Which ones would be more suitable for your um, situation? A brief note on mental models. I said that we need to get into people's heads. And this comes from this idea from systems thinking about the iceberg, where actually 10% of what uh, the problem is what we see and 90% is underwater. So if we really move, want to move that iceberg where we want, we need to go really deep and we want to transform the system. We need to understand people's beliefs and values and hopefully model them in some way. Uh, so the, the problem with this going into to this depth is that people are biased and we walk around the world and we simplify this complexity, this, this wickedness, and everybody has a different mental model. But I think that's a good thing because it taps into this diversity, independence, and local knowledge. So those are three of the ingredients of the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, here's a brief video of some mental modeling work we've been doing in the Salar de Tacama. And these are cognitive maps that we've elicited with uh, stakeholders. So actually, they're not this abstract thing that is in people's heads. You, there's ways you can actually download them from their brains and work with them and find, uh, get incredible insight and depth of what's going on. Social simulation, quickly. Um, I, one, one of the ways and the tools that we use for this is called engine-based modeling. Uh, also called artificial society modeling. And it's this, this idea of having agents in an environment operating under certain rules and that you can run the simulations and some sort of uh, uh, outcomes emerge from the bottom up. So just to give you an example. Imagine you have a flock of, of birds, which is the system you want to model. Say flocking is an analogy for cooperation, say farmers agreeing to sustainably exploit an aquifer. With uh, these kinds of tools, simulation tools, you can uh, think about the rules that could lead to that behavior. You could put it in the computer and see if the model is rep reproducing what uh, either what you want to see in the world or what you're seeing in the world. And if you don't, you can kind of go back and forth so it's like a living laboratory of, uh, for groundwater sustainability. So this, what, what I wanted to prompt you here is to think in, a, in that groundwater problem you, you considered, what, what would be the agents and what would be the rules you would consider um, and how you would like, combine this idea of modeling agents with, uh, with the physical movement of groundwater. Finally, learning by doing. Uh, I just want to do a thought experiment, and this is my one of my last slides today. So just close your eyes and bef imagine we're before COVID or after COVID and that you're leaving on a 20-hour flight from New York to Sydney. And as the plane leaves the gate, uh, you hear the pilot saying something like, um, Hi, I'm Captain John Travolta, and I want you to th thank you for choosing to fly with us today. So I just wanted to let you know, I've recently completed my ground school training and I have read all the manuals, but this is my first time in the cockpit. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight as we learn together. So of, what, what I, what I, the point I want to make here is, uh, the, of course, the scenario is uh, it, it's just Im imaginary, but uh, a pilot only is allowed at the cockpit after hundreds of hours of experience in a flight simulator. So if simulation and this idea of learning by doing is such an important part of a pilot's education, why are we not doing this with uh, groundwater sustainability decisions? Shouldn't our decision makers and even uh, you as uh, researchers and scientists in the making be taught to fly specific patterns and practice crisis resolution before confronting this in a real life situation. So imagine if we train pilot, uh, 
pilots like we do with managers, uh, which is by reading textbooks and, and completing assignments and sitting exams. Um, so my, 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 my point here is I think the same way we, that, that we use these kind of tools for tra training people to make decisions under uncertainty and decisions that can have impact on so many lives, such as in our groundwater basin, we should uh, make it easier uh, for people to access this kind of um, tool and, and avoid the risk of making mistakes on the real system. So this is my uh, last slide, and this is what my vision for this is, uh, this idea that we build these models uh, that have actual agents and people pumping groundwater and their livelihoods being affected by it, um, and that we can put these models literally on the table in front of people so they, people can sit around them and not just sit back on a room and watch us present these numbers and statistics that nobody understands and be able to play these sort of serious games and, and, and start to see how the different trajectories um, of the system could, um, uh, could unfold in the future. And look at the problem through different uh, dimensions. Not only groundwater is just one part of the, 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 the problem, we also need to think about the economy, about social trajectories, jobs, incomes, uh, uh, macroeconomic trajectories like the Atacama Desert, the things that are bigger, that are beyond the basins where groundwater uh, is stored. So I just want you to think, um, reflect on, on that. And how would you think uh, if, if you have the opportunity in the future, how would you set a process like this? How would you find funding for it? Uh, what kinds of problems would you face? Like working, working with people is difficult. So how would you manage those, um, those different mental models that people have? And what do you think would be the outcome? Would it be better than we, ha we have now or would it be worse? I hope it's a better outcome. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Juan. It was so wonderful to hear the story of, of this really compelling story about how to look differently and look forward, both qualitatively and quantitatively at groundwater sustainability. And to be totally honest, one of my favorite things was seeing uh, Bart Simpson come up so many times and uh, thinking about what he would think about groundwater sustainability. So thank you for making how you think about groundwater and, and um, humans uh, so interesting and compelling and, and uh, I hope many people feel the same way and, and come along for the ride with you and, and how you think. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks for, to you and your team. And I'm really looking forward to looking at uh, the whole collection of videos together. Cool. Thank you, Juan. Yeah.